U.S. European Chinese journalist who writes for the German newspaper The Tots and alternates between Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Berlin. Andrew Dennison, how profound is this reorientation? Take us through its main elements, if you would. Well, Melinda, you know that Europe and America are intertwined like no other two centers of power on this planet. And any time America shifts its orientation, there's going to be some, some concern. People don't like to upset the apple cart. But what we see here is Obama taking into account two major factors. First, the American economy is in trouble. And for America to be powerful abroad, it must rebuild its economy at home, which also means cutting in defense spending. It means in national strategies, uh, the emphasis on rebuilding economic uh, potential. So and one main also, element taking troops out of Europe, he's going to be pulling a whole lot right. of soldiers out of Europe. Exactly. Now, these soldiers have been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay. Oftentimes, Europe is, is still a central logistical uh, component of America's global defense strategy. But it is also true that Asia is rising, billions of new consumers clamoring for political rights. We don't know what the future of the states there will be. And we also see that many smaller countries around China have been expressing openly their concern that China may be getting a little too uh, powerful militarily in the South China Sea, for example. And I think it was wise politics on the part of Obama to say, I hear you, Australia. I hear you, Japan, South Korea. Let's talk a little bit about these things. But I don't I don't think Obama is looking for a military confrontation with China. He simply wants to chum up with the countries around China because the old rule of geopolitics, he with the most friends wins, is also applicable for Obama. Walter Stutzler, ever since the Cold War ended, the Europeans and perhaps especially the Germans have been worrying that the U.S. would turn its back on Europe. Is that finally now proving to be true? I actually have never been worrying about that because I think the uh, United States being a global power has all the right, actually the duty, to adjust its strategy to what uh, reality has. And reality is, Andrea has rightly stated, reality is that the new centers of development is not in Europe, it is in Asia. And it would be foolish on part of the United States not to address these changes. So what the president actually does, and one, in my view, one can only applaud uh, this uh, uh, new readjustment, is to realign American interest to what actually develops in Asia. China is, the leading eco is, is going to be the leading economic power. It is already the biggest creditor to the United States. It is helping the European Union to save the euro currency. It is buying one company after the other in Europe. Actually, only last night I heard that the Chinese company bought one of the finest Swabian companies uh, that works in the field. No other company works in. Uh, in. So 
it would be foolish not to address these issues. And how precisely does the reorientation do that besides pulling troops out of Europe? That's not a policy. Well, I think the pulling, the reduction of American troops in Europe actually amounts to a very small number because what is left, the army, I think American army has 40,000 troops right now in Europe. Uh, he will reduce that number by 8,000, so it goes down to 32. Most of them have actually anyway not been in Europe, but uh, as Andrew rightly said, they've been involved in other, other wars, Afghan, Iraq, Libya, what have you, Kosovo, and so on and so forth. No, I think it is a message to the Chinese, to the Japanese, to Australia, to New Zealand, we are here. We want to be your ally. We, are pre we, the United States, we are prepared to help you, to assist you. Let's not forget that the United States is building up a military garrison in, 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 in Australia, a small one, but that is how it starts. So the military function is more the kind of a flag. It, it signals. It's not about, it's, there's no actual and current defense need. There's no need for the United States to come militarily to the help of Australia. But yes, there's a garrison. There are 400 people, you know, finest American brave soldiers, Marines. So the world knows, okay, the um, American interest is here. And we are going, to, we are we prepared to develop it. That's, that's not bad. That's, that's a good strategy. So, Felix Lee, if the U.S. is espousing its identity as a Pacific power, what does that mean for what's ahead? Are we looking at a new trans-Pacific epoch, the way that we had in the past a transatlantic one? And, and how do you think it's going to look? We're definitely looking uh, to a new um, to new policy um, and and uh, to more important pacific region than the transatlantic region but um, so far i would also say it was good that the americans were present in the asia pacific region for example taiwan now um, uh, uh, a healthy democracy that wouldn't happen if the americans weren't there also um, dealing with north korea but um, um, on the same i wouldn't say um, I, or, or i would be careful for the americans to use the same strategy um, uh, in asia as in europe 30 years ago because asia is totally different from europe what do you what do you mean by that elaborate um, a bit if you would first um, um, the, the alleged allies, supposed to be allies, in, especially in Southeast Asia, I wouldn't say they are very eligible. Um, or because, um, for example, you, you mentioned the, um, the, the, the troops in Australia, uh, the American troops now. I mean, why are they in Australia? Because um, the other Asian Southeast Asian countries, um, they definitely want help from the Americans, but not too much, not to be too provocative towards China. They want the weapons, the, um, the, the, the technology, but hopefully not the GIs. And, and this is totally different in Asia than from Europe 30 or 50 years ago. On the same hand, um, I would also agree um, and, um, that so far Asia is not a, a hot spot yet. So far, um, China, or, uh, Ch Chinese is not, China is not a major threat yet. And um, I would warn to take out the old Cold War talk and, and make China into uh, something to a threat which is not so far. Um, no, don't wake, no, no don't immediate. Don't wake a sleeping giant. No, no, no there's no say. immediate threat, but there are territorial disputes. Yeah. For instance, between China and Vietnam and the South, South China, China Sea, sea. Yeah, but there are in, minor. Um, very yeah. important disputes forthcoming about resources. There are strategic sea communication lines through the South China Sea. So it is, it is not trivial uh, to, uh, to have um, all political instruments available to deal with that situation. And I think that's what the president has in mind. And of course, he is much aware of the fact that there is no love between China and Japan. Maybe not trivial, but also don't overload this. No, uh, no, no, what's, no. What's happening. Right. Don't wake right a sleeping now. giant, Andrew Dennison, <laughs> says uh, Felix Lee. 
What do you think? To what degree does the U.S. see China as a threat now? And to what degree could the U.S. be creating that threat by waking the sleeping giant? Okay. Well, well China is, of course, very important, although I don't think we should exaggerate <coughs> China's economic potential. We should not exaggerate the relative importance of China compared to Europe. The United States invests nine times as much in Holland as it does in all of China, seven times as much in England as in all of China. America makes about twice as much money on its economic relations with Europe as it does with all of Asia, Japan, China, South Korea. So let us not put the cart ahead of the horse. China remains an impoverished country where the average wage is about one-tenth of that of the United States. But it's changing fast, and it's bringing over a billion, a billion, three hundred million consumers. And for me, one of the greatest threats of China is not its military power. It's either that it collapses because it cannot contain the contradictions of rapid growth, or its environmental consumption as the living standards rise to Western levels, poison the atmosphere and leave us in horrible shape. That's the big challenge. Finally, I think it's important to underline that even though Asia is the area of focus, America has no more important partner than Europe. The institute that I direct, Transatlantic Networks, we have long had the motto Pax Atlantica, for Pax Humana, Europe and America together have the challenge of helping the world enjoy a little more of the freedom, of the peace and the prosperity that we enjoy. Sometimes we take it for granted. But that move in the next 30 or 40 years is a challenge that only Europe and America have the intellectual and material resources left to help the world on that path. We can't expect China alone to solve its problems. No. It needs Agree. Western help. Felix Lee, how is China reacting to the new defense strategy of the U.S.? Has there been an official or an unofficial reaction? What are you hearing? Um, they're looking very um, um, intensely on what's uh, on, on this plan, for, uh, Obama's plan. But um, I, I wouldn't say that they're nervous or anything like that because China has a, a, a difference. Uh, China's strategy is very um, very complicated. First thing is. Okay, Taiwan, Tibet, the, um, which which they see as them themselves, it's not untouchable. Okay, and if um, um, any other country or the Western countries or the U.S. tries to intervene in these, um, China definitely would um, uh, would be um, would would um, looking would look for military action. Um, but the second, as you mentioned, um, what considering uh, concerning the neighboring countries. Um, they don't really care what's happening with the neighboring countries as long as long they don't make trouble. And, um, and it's also not a hegemonial st um, strategy as what we know, um, what we know used to be from, um, um, uh, from Western countries. And on the third, okay, you, you, you mentioned trade routes, routes and um, also uh, raw materials and um, economic um, um, interests. Okay, they definitely exist, but I don't think that China so far uh, thinks it's worse to um, go into military action because of economic issues. Mm -hmm. And this is why I wouldn't, I still would always say, okay, China is a, um, a growing and a growing power, but don't exaggerate. Um, um, well, the interest is not so much that they really co are considering military action. Not exaggerate, but the simple fact is that China actually has embraced the notion that we, are, we, we all know it is the economy, stupid. Mm. Chinese are currently <laughs> with a new built navy off the coast Somalia. They are with the Chinese Navy of Arden. Mm -hmm. They are actually, no one talks about it, they actually participate in NATO guided operations against pirates in the South Arabian Sea. Yeah, but this is together with the West. Absolutely. Arab, right? the, but this is clever. Yeah. This is strategy. This is something and that in business circles is now called co opetition. Okay. One cooperates yeah. and competes at the same and time. And as our soldiers die for whatever purpose in Afghanistan, the Chinese were <laughs> clever enough to buy the copper mines. 
And the United Nations couldn't get a, a Security Council vote on the situation in Sudan. Why? Because China blocked it. Why? Because of the oil interest in Sudan. So on and so forth. So but they, can you blame uh, China for that? No, 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 I don't blame it. Yeah. I, I, I applaud the American president, the president of the United States, for taking note of reality as it has changed and for redirecting our our attention to where it should be, and it should be in, in Asia. Andrew Dennison, one of the main realities, you mentioned it at the outset, that the president's taking account of, of course, is the budgetary one. He is looking at billions of dollars in budget cuts in the Pentagon budget starting in 2013. What does that actually mean for the future strength of the U.S.? Are we looking at a retreat from the position of global superpower as we've known the U.S. until now? Well, Melinda, I don't think so. I think if you look at America's military power, it, it is far beyond all the other countries together, particularly in the crucial area of securing the global sea lines, the sea lanes, the, the global commons, if you will. And there, too, I think China is, at the end of the day, going to realize it benefits as much from an open South China Sea as anyone else. America has so much in reserve that it can afford to save hundreds of billions in defense today, and if a crisis arises tomorrow, it will have the flexibility and the capacity to meet that challenge. I think when we look at China, though, we should remember, first of all, that the United States <coughs> is less dependent on China than China is on American markets and American banks. And at the end of the day, I think China has a huge interest in cooperating with America. One of the main security problems, military problems, in the area is North Korea. And there I think we can look at China and say, we'd like more help, more pressure on the North Korean regime, yeah. but for China it's difficult because they fear a unified Korea. Yeah. So that's one area, but again, it's not, a, it's not competition, it's more like res Together. respective fears that you need to work yeah. through. Let's Don't take a look. Let, yeah. Let's just take one brief look back at the time when the U.S. was the world's uncontested superpower, power, the world's policeman. 1992 in the heart of Europe. Yugoslavia is falling apart. Its civil war is taking thousands of lives. Civilians are being massacred. The country's European neighbors and the UN stand by helplessly. The US bombs Serbia and compels it to the peace table. In 1999, US forces return to the Balkans, stepping in to solve another European crisis in Kosovo. 12 years later, in 2011, civil war breaks out in Libya. This time, the U.S. takes a new approach, later dubbed leading from behind. It is England and France that bear the brunt of responsibility for Operation Unified Protector. Walter Stützler, with the U.S. looking at all those budget cuts, making a virtue out of a necessity in terms of making the military smaller and leaner, more mobile, what does that mean for Europe? Is it ready to pick up the slack? Well, I don't think they are ready to pick up the slack. What uh, Europe, the European Union actually, we talk about, uh, suffers most from in, in the field of defense is the non-cooperation on part of the nation states. France, Britain, mm -hmm. Germany, Spain, Italy and others simply can't manage to, to get their act together and actually, if not integrate, at least cooperate. So what you see in Europe is a great number of national restructuring of national forces without even talking to each other, without even informing each other. Now, this is no good uh, uh, fundament on which to build, no good platform on, on, on which to build uh, doing good on what the Americans probably will no longer perform. The question, however, is, and, and the new word, uh, wording is smart defense. Do they really now mean serious business or not? And my, I'm afraid they don't mean serious business. I think they will continue and uh, it will still need the United States to lead in the field of defense. Felix Lee, 
if we look at that Libyan mission that we saw in the report, um, Germany wasn't even part of it. Germany certainly didn't acquit itself uh, with great glory in the case of Libya. The fact is Germany's got a strong economy. It's the powerhouse of the, of the European Union. And yet uh, its willingness to take part in military operations is still very, very ambivalent and limited, isn't it? Hmm. I'm not sure if um, it was a good uh, a step from the German government at that time um, to be um, to to not cooperate with the other with the other allies. But one decision I must uh, or I think is was right is um, um, opposing this war because I think in the whole um, 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 bombing. Um, Gaddafi away, that was not a good choice for uh, t that the NATO was doing this. And because this is not the, um, the work uh, what the NATO was founded for, and, and I'm not sure if there would be better ways um, to get rid of Gaddafi or to, to solve this problem. And in this term, Germany could, could have done um, other steps um, um, on a, on a diploma diplomatic way um, to solve the problem. Try even harder. And this is what I was missing at that time. But I wouldn't blame Germany for not, um, uh, for not cooperating in this war. Andrew Dennison, it's an old discussion, of course, that's familiar to all of us who've been based in Germany for the past 20 or 30 years, burden sharing. To what degree do you think the Germans are ready to pick up a greater b burden in the area of military and defense? And to what extent can the rest of Europe, also facing budgetary pressures, uh, pull more weight? Well, first of all, to Libya, in terms of burden sharing. Let, let's not stay too okay. much on the but, subject of but Libya. If, I'd if, like to if talk Guido about Guido Westerwelle, Germany's chief diplomat, had been able to convince Muammar Gaddafi to turn the tanks around and drive away from Benghazi and perhaps to resign and certainly to stop his helicopters from firing on uh, civilians, then I would have said that is burden sharing and diplomacy's day has come. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. And what we see is a Germany that not only refuses to spend on defense, having not met NATO's 2% of GDP goal for the last 10 years, only about one cent on the euro is used for defense. But Germany also talks about the importance not of military influence, but of diplomatic influence. Well, if the Germans would spend as much on their foreign ministry as they do on their Bundeswehr, we might start talking about diplomatic influence. If the Germans had more development workers in Afghanistan than soldiers, you could talk about diplomatic influence. But I think it's a problem when the Germans say military is the wrong way to do it, but have no alternative. Walter Stutze, you told us you think realistically the U.S. will continue to have to play a major role. Are you confident, given the cuts in the U.S. military budget, that it is going to be able and willing to do so? Yes. Uh, given the agenda, I think it's good enough what the Americans uh, actually uh, generate in terms of military power. The most important thing is not the military power, it's the political power. And as long as the European nation states do not agree to do what they have promised to do, which is to integrate politically, they will have no influence, they will have no major say in international affairs. They will pay. Actually, Germany showed us an enormous onus in terms of saving um, and protecting the euro currency. This goes into the billions of, of euros. But it does not translate into political, into political power, into political influence, because why talk to to Germany if you can play with France and Britain? And why talk to Britain if you can play Germany against France? This is what the Chinese are doing. This is what the Americans actually are doing. This is what I would be doing if I was sitting in the White House. And as long as the Europeans do not accept that integration is the only way for them to move forward to, they will have no influence. So, Felix Lee, Walter Stutz is basically giving us a corollary of Clausewitz's famous dictum that military might is political power by other means. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And I would totally agree with you. Um, 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 world policy today is not so much about military action anymore. It's not the major issue anymore. It's about um, um, having a political agenda and having a united political agenda. And um, 
Europe is not capable in having a, fis a, co a common fiscal policy, and they are also not, um, so far, they do have no democratic legitimized um, institution who are able to form a an, uh, security and foreign policy, united foreign and security policy. This is one problem, and um, looking and dealing with Asia, um, I think um, it would be important to have this united strategy. Andrew Dennison, just summing up, if you would, please, because we're almost out of time. End of the transatlantic age, rise of the trans-Pacific one, or somehow a foot in each No, world? I would agree with Zbigniew Brzezinski, who wrote in Foreign Affairs, revitalize the West, balance the East. And first of all, Europe needs economic growth. Then it needs to commit itself to securing and encouraging prosperity around its periphery. And then I think America and Europe will have a way to bring China and Asia into the modern world. Andrew Dennison, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for being uh, here with us today. And thanks to all of you out there for tuning in.